And shall we open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 35. We continue our study through John's Gospel. If you begin reading about verse 19 or so of the chapter, you might get the idea that John was writing from a journal. Because he is very meticulous about laying out for us the first week of Jesus' public ministry. And there's a couple of reasons for that that I think we'll discover. But if you look at verse 19, it says, this is the testimony of John. But then when you get to verse 29, you read, now the next day. And so we have day one, then we have day two, verse 35, and again the next day. And then we'll get to verse 43 and we'll read, and then the following day. And then Jesus will turn and go up to the Galilee. And so chapter 2, verse 1, since it's a three-day walk from Jerusalem, we'll begin in three days later. So John is very good at writing down for us, chronologically, the first week of Jesus' ministry. And over the next couple of days, five men will develop a relationship with the Lord and begin to follow him and will become his disciples. This morning we want to look at what a disciple is. Both from John the Baptist's leadership and then the boys that go to follow the Lord The lesson is, are we disciples? So my question for you is, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? The word disciple, mathetes in Greek, means a follower, an adherent, a a student, a learner, one who is on his team and in his camp. Are you one of those? And if you are, how does that show up in your life? How would people in the world be able to identify you as a follower of Christ, a disciple? What makes you different in what you do and how you go about doing those things? What what sets you apart? I saw some PETA protesters the other day, and without them saying a word to me, I went, ah, PETA protesters. You could identify them for what they were, by what they said, by how they went about it. I, I have some friends that are Rastafarians. You know those guys? the Bob Marley group, you can tell who they are. You don't even need to speak to them. I know that guy. I know what that guy's into. So what are you into? And what sets you apart from the world? What does the onlooking world see in you, in your behavior? And those are the things that I think the Lord would talk to us about this morning. Chesterton, who was a great teacher in the last century, wrote that Christianity had not been tried and found wanting. He says Christianity is difficult and it hasn't been tried. And his point was that it's a difficult life to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. That's, that doesn't sound like a great invitation unless you're committed to Christ. I mean, our our world is not filled with people that are living self-denial lives. (laughs) Self-indulgence, maybe, but not self-denial. And and take up your cross sounds painful. And daily sounds way too often. I'm pretty busy for all of that. And yet a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, an intern, a devotee, a disciple knows the Lord, and and by the Lord is changed, and his commitments grow stronger day by day. In in a couple of verses here, John will use the word disciple twice, in verse 35 and verse 37, and then he will add the word follow, or following, three more times, in verse 37, in verse 38, and in verse uh, verse 40 as well. And the word akalutheo in, in, in Greek means to join sides or be a party to or to stand with by way of support to accompany. So are you a disciple of Jesus? And I'd like to give you four or five words that you can write down or think about in terms of that from our text. Beginning with this first word, affiliation. Verse 35. The next day, John the Baptist writes, John uh, sorry, John writes, John the Baptist, uh, oh, I'm going to mess this all up. Too many Johns here. Again, the next day, John the Baptist stood with two of his disciples, John the Apostle writes. And looking at Jesus, he, as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples who heard him speak, they followed Jesus. Affiliation. Look, every believer should be a disciple of Christ. 
No matter where you grew up in the Lord, no matter what you went through to prepare you for the day when you accepted the Lord into your life, his ultimate desire is that you become his disciple. Now, that's not always the case, at least not immediately, and for some, hardly ever. You know, the, the Corinthians were, were carnal as could be. They believed in the Lord. They believed in Jesus, but man, they were fleshed out kind of Christians. They fought with one another about who had baptized them and took pride in having been baptized by Paul or by Peter or by Apollos. And, and, and there was this longing and a desire to be aligned with a group that you thought was more important than the others. Look, all of us are saved through somebody's ministry. And you might have grown up in a church that you love or read authors that you really find helpful in your spiritual walk. But if it doesn't get you to be Jesus' disciple, it's no good. Because that's the point of the work of God in your life, is that you might belong to Jesus. You might be his disciple. I hear people sometimes say, I'm, I'm proud to be a Methodist. Which just tells me that they believe in the teachings of John Wesley and George Whitefield. And, and that's great, as long as they become disciples of Jesus. Or I'm a, I'm a strong Lutheran. I follow the teachings of Martin Luther and John Calvin, and I'm one of their disciples. Well, that's fine, as long as you become a disciple of Jesus. I love to listen to John MacArthur. I love listening to Chuck Swindoll. I'm a Chuck Smith fan. That's fine, as long as you become a disciple of Jesus. You don't want to be a disciple of men. And, and truth be told, most Leaders love when people follow them. You talk to Christians, and if they're involved in the ministry, they usually want to tell you how blessed they've been and how their ministry has done so much, and now we've got these folks coming in, and look at us. All of that, unimportant. Are you producing disciples of Jesus? Are people leaving your presence and walking with him? It doesn't matter if you're a small group leader or a pastor of a, a mega church. You know, we love when we have impact. We, we, we find ourselves useful and beneficial when we can point to fruit that has come through our lives and say, look at that. Look at me. Yet, you are at your best in ministry when you help people turn to Jesus and begin to walk with him. And, and I want you to notice John here. Because he's been at this for a year, and these two disciples that now leave Jesus, John the Baptist's side and follow Jesus were his guys. Guys that he had ministered with and worked with and, and supported and, and stood with and taught. They were people that he loved, and they no doubt loved him and the ministry that God had given him. But that's not the end of ministry. For John, the end of ministry was, he's over there. <laughs> now get out of here. <laughs> Go follow him. And by the time you get to chapter 3, verse 30, it's John the Baptist saying, I've got to now decrease, and he's got to increase. And if you've read ahead, you know that that's true. Besides a, a little honorable mention in chapter 3, John the Baptist is gone now from the pages of the book of John because it's about Jesus. And so should our ministries be. John was a true minister. He wasn't interested in drawing men after himself, but only that they would follow Jesus. And, and true ministry allows people to switch from personality and denomination and peer group to Jesus. Ultimately, disciples affiliate with Jesus. So are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And how does that show in your affiliation to him? Because if your goal in ministry is you or your success or you being known, you're going to miss the boat. You're going to miss the boat. And I'll tell you what, if you commit yourself to men, then if that man falls, so do you. Oh, I so looked up to him. I can't believe what he did. My faith is ruined. Well, Jesus hasn't changed. I have never had Jesus stumble me one time. I've had people mess me up a lot. I've messed myself up a lot. But not the Lord. You get people right with Jesus, they'll be fine. Now, that doesn't mean others can't help you, and God doesn't use one another to be encouraging. But the end is him, not us. I am personally convinced that every Christian ought to be in a local church that you ought to commit yourself to and involve yourself with, to serve and love and be accountable. 
I think it's absolutely imperative for your spiritual well-being that you find a place and you plug in. And that you don't run off the first time the usher doesn't say hello to you. Or the person didn't move over for you. Or they cut me off in the parking lot. This place stinks. I'm out of here. And the reason you shouldn't do that is the next place you go is going to stink too. And so will the third stop on your list of churches you've tried. So unless it's a doctrinal issue or the Bible isn't taught or, you know, you, you get the sermonette of the day, you should find a church and plug in. It doesn't have to be here, but you should find some place that, that, that you can grow. And I've seen people leave here just out of anger, and it, it grieves me because I know that's not the work of the Lord. That's foolishness. But I've also seen people leave here that go somewhere else and do far better spiritually. And then I just figure that's where God wanted them to grow. If they can get closer to Jesus somewhere else, please go. Please go. Because you and I are going to come and go, but he's going to remain. So it's important that you see ministry at least as far as it goes to the end as turning people to Christ. It's natural to be drawn to people and churches and teaching styles and but, but a disciple transitions to Jesus. <laughs> you know, you've got you to be his disciple. There he is, go follow him. Follow him. Eva affiliation first. Second of all, evaluation. Verse 38. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, they said, uh, sorry, he said to them, what do you seek? Now, these are Jesus' first recorded words in John's Gospel. If you have one of those red-letter Bibles, these are the first letters in red in the Gospel of John. And, and you might have expected, since John wants to talk about Jesus being God, that the first words out of Jesus' mouth should be some theological, heavy-duty concept where we go, oh, that is the Lord. Right? I mean, that's what we would expect to find. Instead, turning Jesus talks to two of John the Baptist's disciples, and he basically says to them, so what do you want? What do you want? Really? This is the big theological statement? What do you want? <laughs> now here's the deal. Jesus never asks questions in the Bible because he's at a loss. Two guys following him, they look strange. What are you guys up to? No, he knew. He always knows, doesn't he, being God? Whenever you find the Lord asking questions in the Bible, and there's a lot of them, they are always designed to probe the motivation or the heart of the person to whom he speaks, always. So you will find the Lord using it as a teaching tool, questions. <laughs> we do that with our kids, don't we? The Lord does that with us. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. Adam, where are you? I think he knew where Adam was. Third rock from the left, hiding. <laughs> he had sinned. He was naked. He saw it. He knew. And the Lord asks him a question to draw him out, to bring him to his senses, to evaluate, if you will, his motivation, what was in his heart. And Jesus turns to these men, and he asks them to evaluate, why are you coming after me? What are you looking for? What are you after? It's a probing question about motivation. It's supposed to draw you out into the people to whom Jesus spoke. It did. Matthew 16, sitting at the beautiful a water source there at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said to the boys, who do men say that I am? And everybody had an answer. And then Jesus said, and who do you say that I am? And then came the answer that only the Lord could make clear. To the fella laying by the pool of Bethesda there in John 5, which we'll get to eventually. I know that we will. <laughs> if you hang around long enough. As long as an usher is nice to you. I mean, here's a man laying as an invalid beside a pool for 38 years, living on the hoax and the, and the folklore of the, of the culture that says when the water stirred and the angel touched it, the first one in got healed, and he couldn't get in. And so Jesus walked up to this man in, in the midst of a feast day of the Passover, and he said, would you like to be well? well there's got to be more to it. And of course I want to be well. Maybe I haven't seen how long I've been laying here. I've grown this beard since I got here. Look at it. But the Lord brought him out and sought to reach him in this hopeless condition, in this hopeless faith that he had in the folklore of the day. To the rich young ruler, he said, Why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. What did he mean by that? Well, the rich young ruler was here to, to investigate who Jesus was, and his first answer to him was, There's only one good, that's God. So you have two choices. Either I'm not good, and you're wrong, or I'm God. And that's the answer you're looking for. 
In John 21, Jesus will take a brokenhearted and a defeated Peter and three times say to him in front of his peers, Peter, do you love me? And Peter will get to reconcile the failures that he had brought, even though he was convinced that he could serve the Lord faithfully. So when Jesus turns around and says to these two boys, what do you want? He is asking them to evaluate the reason for their coming. To question their intentions. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, that, that church that wasn't doing so well, in his second letter, said in chapter 13, verse 5 to them, you should examine yourself whether you be in the faith and know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you or not. So there's nothing wrong with being honest about yourself and where you stand. Disciples are willing to have themselves checked out. David prayed there in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my motivation, my intention, my heart. See if there's anything wicked in me, and then lead me in the ways of everlasting life. And Jesus stopped John's disciples in their tracks. What do you want? Now what if the Lord came here this morning and said to you, what do you want? What would you say? First thing out of your mouth. First thing in your mind. What do you want, says the Lord? What would you say? I want success. I want money. I want a, 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 a husband or a wife. Or children. There's a lot of things we might want. But a disciple wants nothing more than to know God and serve him. Ultimately. I want what you want, Lord. I want to know what your will is. I want to follow you and please you and serve you. A.W. Tozer wrote a book, and if you've never read In Pursuit of God, I would suggest that you go read it. It'll beat you to death like the book of James, but it, it, it'll get to the heart of the, of the matter. But he wrote in, in Pursuit of God that, that complacency is the deadly enemy of spiritual growth, and unless there's an acute desire for the Lord in the heart, God cannot make himself known to his people because, he says, God wants to be wanted. Now, I've always remembered that line, God wants to be wanted. So the Lord said to these two boys following, what do you want? What are you looking for? How powerful is that? Disciples check their hearts. They evaluate regularly their walks. Affiliation, evaluation. Third word, association. A disciple surrenders himself to God's word. Verse 38 there in the middle. They said to, what do you seek or what do you want? Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying. They remained with him that day and it was about the tenth hour. Now, the two disciples answered Jesus' question with a question of their own. And if you read it superficially, it sounds like a pretty weird conversation. What do you want? Where are you staying? Come and see. Kind of disjointed. <laughs> well, they weren't asking Jesus for his address or his cell phone number. They were asking to know more about him. We want to learn about you. We want to draw near to you. We want to spend time with you. In fact, John here in verse 38 and 39 uses one of his favorite words, and he'll use it a lot. And, and the Greek word is meno. If you want to remember it in English, just remember me, no. And the word meno is, is translated various ways, staying, staying, remained here. They're the same word. But it is the Greek word that means to make yourself at home, or to settle in, or to abide. In fact, when you get to that John 15 chapter where Jesus talks about abiding in him and that you can't really bear fruit without him, he'll use this word meno, me know, 11 times. It, it, it is one of John's favorite. It means to, to make yourself at home. A disciple you know, associates with Jesus and is at home with him, and Jesus is at home in their life. He's welcome there. He fits. <laughs> he can stay. It is an invitation for, for drawing near. And so these boys use that word. Where are you staying? What are you seeking? Where are you staying? Where, can, where are you abiding and living? Can we come and draw closer to you? They wanted to hang out with him. And, and look at his answer in verse 39. Just come and see. Instead of information, he gives them an invitation. And the invitation was met by the disciples' surrender. Notice verse 39. Come and see, and they came and saw. Beautiful, isn't it? Come and see, they came and saw. True disciples of Jesus will associate with him and surrender to him. Now, you could have seen two guys saying, 
Well, how far is it? When are we going to eat? I'm pretty tired. Is tomorrow at two better? Could we come maybe next week? Could we, put this on the, could we schedule an appointment? These boys heard, what do you want? They said, Lord, we just want to know where you live, what, what you're all about. We want to know you. And he went, well, come on. And they went. They followed. They immediately responded. The real test of a disciple of Jesus is surrender. So let me ask you again, are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you surrender your life to his commands? Do you, do you make decisions based on his word? Do you check out to see what God would want you to do in every situation? Is that the interest that you have as his people? Because you can know the Lord and not really allow him to be the Lord of your life. That was true of the Corinthians. It was true for several folks in the Bible. Nicodemus knew the Lord. He became his disciple after he died. Secret until then. Not much good in that. Joseph of Arimathea was the same way. Are you willing to surrender to him? Or if I put it another way, is he the Lord of your life or not? Is he the boss? Or are you the boss? Do you drive and he sits in the back seat and you go where you want and then you go, hey Lord, bless this. And the Lord said, where are we? <laughs> well, I've taken you where I believe we should be going. Well, I don't like it here. Well, I suppose you want to drive. That's right. I'd like to be the Lord. At some point in your Christian life, you're going to have to come to grips with the Lordship of Jesus. We sing Lord a lot. It's almost in every worship song that we have. But is he your Lord? Because there is, unfortunately, this oftentimes a, a tremendous distinction between formal theology, what we believe in our heads, and practical theology, what we do with our lives. What we say we believe and what we really believe based on what we do can sometimes be miles apart. If this is your extent of your relationship with God, an hour here on Sunday mornings, I suggest Jesus is not your Lord. You might believe in him, but it's going to be awful tough to follow him on what you hear from me in 40 minutes. It's not much of a relationship that you have with him. It's possible to say we believe something when in reality we believe something else, and we can fool ourselves about it and give ourselves a pass. I heard the story of a little goat who wanted to be a lion and said he was a lion. He thought the first step to being a lion is acting like one. So he'd walk like a lion, and sometimes he'd roar like a lion, or so he'd try to, but he was a goat. It didn't sell it all that good. And one day he was convinced he'd arrive, so he went out to eat with the lions. End of story. <laughs> End of goat. It's one thing to say you are something, it's quite another to be it. And there are plenty of Christ followers who know nothing about being his disciple because they haven't become that. They're not doing at all what he says. And, and the world couldn't distinguish them from the world around them because there's no living for him. What do you want? We want to know where you abide. Then come and see. And they came and went. But then at the end of verse 39, you have this odd little phrase in parentheses. It was about the 10th hour. And I don't know about you, but with all the heavy talk of discipleship and Jesus being the Lamb of God, you know, a report of what time it is doesn't seem to fit. And the Lord, he's God, the Lamb of God, he's going to take away the sins of the world. And by the way, it was about the 10th hour. So you have to say, well, what in the world's going on? Let me give you a couple things you ought to know. Number one, the Gospel of John is the only Gospel that uses Roman time. Roman time is just like your time. Day starts at midnight. So when you read in the book of John, the 10th hour, it'll be 10 in the morning. All of the other Gospels use Jewish time, which starts roughly at 6 in the morning. So this, at the 10th hour for them, would be 4 in the afternoon. But John, you know, Jerusalem has been overthrown. The Jews have been scattered. He uses Roman time. And so John says, in his writing, they went to follow Jesus, come and see. They came and went, and it was about 10 in the morning. And we discover that though one of these men that came was Andrew, verse 40, the other man that came was no doubt John himself, who never refers to himself by name. We'll find that to be true in a couple of chapters as well. But suffice it for now to say that 60 years later, this old original apostle still remembered the day that he became right with God. In fact, he didn't just remember the day, he remembered the hours about 10 o'clock. It stayed with him when nothing, you might not next, last week be able to say when you had a meeting with someone, but John, 60 years later, when it was 10 in the morning. 
I remember when he said, Where, what do you want? And we said, we want to hang out with you. And he said, well, then come on. And it changed his life. It was John's spiritual birthday, if you will. And we learned that, that this disciple who, who affiliated with Jesus and evaluated his heart, and then he sought to um, associate himself with the Lord, remembers it to the time. <laughs> it was that, that first day that Jesus was pointed out. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. Fourthly, you want to write the word down evangelize, or evangelization, if you like the, the rhymes, affiliation, valuation, association, evangelization. Because disciples will inevitably want to make other disciples. So let me ask you again, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you making other disciples? Verse 40. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and then followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and he first finds his own brother Simon, and he says to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Disciples want to share their faith and make other disciples. There is no way you can keep a true disciple of Jesus quiet. Impossible. Can you imagine the excitement in Andrew's voice when he goes to tell his own brother Simon that he had discovered the Messiah, the Christos, as it's written here in Greek, the anointed one, the Messiah. And Andrew goes back to his own family and he starts sharing what he has learned and he comes to know. Disciples want other disciples. In the New Testament, you will run across, especially in the Gospels, Jesus from time to time saying to people in whose life he has done great things, don't tell anyone. You'll run into it four or five, six different times. Don't tell anyone. No one ever listened to that. He opens the eyes of the mind. He goes, tell no one. Yeah, excuse me. Hey, look at my eyes. <laughs> Raises a little girl from the dead. Don't tell anyone. Really? I'm not telling anyone? Sorry, Lord. This is going to be my first sin now. I'm telling everyone. Because when you meet the Lord for who he is, you cannot keep it to yourself. Today, the Lord says to the church, tell everyone. Do they? Well, the disciples do. But the believers from afar can't, won't. Because the cost is too great. I might be made fun of. They, they, they're going to categorize me as one of those right-wing Fox News watching people. <laughs> those born-again conservative folks. I don't want that. But if the Lord has spoken to your heart and you become a disciple, you really don't care what everyone else thinks. You just care what he thinks. Because I owe him my life, not you, him. If you're not making disciples, maybe it's because you're not one. Because it's easy to keep the secret of Jesus if he's not making much of an impact in your own life. Doesn't mean much to me. I go to church every week. By the way, every time you run into Andrew in the scriptures, he's bringing people to Jesus. It's just kind of a side note. This is free. This is free. This is extra. It has nothing to do with the sermon. <laughs> every time. He, he lives in the shadow of his brother Simon, right? You see Simon a lot. You see Andrew very little. But, but in chapter 6, I think it's in chapter 6 of this book. I, again, we'll get to it. Um, he, he finds that boy in the crowd who actually has food when everybody's starving. He brings him to Jesus. In chapter 10 or 12, no, I think it's chapter 12, the, the, the Greek contingency come to town during a, a Jewish feast day, and they ask to see Jesus, and, and Andrew handles the request. He's just always there handling stuff. And, and you must know that Andrew was a great disciple. The word Andrew means manly. He was a tough man's man fisherman in a partnership with James and Peter and John in the lucrative fishing industry, but this fellow fell in love with Jesus and he became his disciple, and this rough and tough guy at every turn was bringing people to Christ. He was a disciple indeed. So, are you a disciple of Christ? And he starts with his own family. Because a disciple can't keep good news to himself. He'll go out and seek to persuade others to follow. And it usually starts at home which is both a good and a bad thing, I guess. It's good in the sense that these are the people you care about the most. And so you want them to hear the most. But they're also the ones who know you the best. 
and are going to deal with you with great skepticism. Jesus said, a prophet has honor everywhere but at home, you know, except in his own country. And there's a reason for that. People are doubtful of you. You've been like this all your life. What are you, who's buying this now? But eventually they'll listen. And it is certainly true that personal evangelism and discipleship amongst those that you care about is far more effective than huge crusades or cold kind of street witnessing where, where the word is given, but the lifestyle that supports it and sustains it is not seen. And even the large crusades are usually dependent upon people doing personal evangelism. But make no mistake about it, true disciples have evangelical hearts. And if you don't have that, or if you can say of yourself, I haven't shared my faith with someone in a year, then you might want to go back to step one, affiliation. Hanging out with Jesus and hang out with him until you have something to say. Finally, the word transformation. Now when Jesus, verse 42 there in the middle, looked at Peter, he said to him, you are Simon the son of Jonah, you will be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Disciples are changed by the Lord daily. If you are truly a disciple of Jesus, then this year you ought to be loving the Lord more than you did last year. And next year you ought to have a greater love for him than you have this year, because you will have grown in your knowledge of his ways. You'll be, you'll be serving him more faithfully and, and more fruitfully in your endeavors. You'll be devoted to him more in your time, more committed in your walk, more desirous of fellowship, more influential in ministry. Things ought to get better for you, right? It might be the only place that the word evolve actually works. You ought to be moving in his direction. I, I find that so often the, the most excited Christians are new Christians. That's a tragedy. New Christians don't know anything, except I'm lost and he wants to save me. I guess I'm in. That's it. They don't know about the mercies of God, the grace of God, the word of God, the teachings of God, the ways of God. They haven't experienced the life of God. But why is it that the more you know, the less you care? Disciples go forward, not backward. And some of you stopped growing the week after you prayed to receive the Lord. That's not discipleship. That's stagnation. It rhymes. It just doesn't fit. So they bring Simon to Jesus, and notice that it says Jesus looked at him, and he uses the word emblepo. He only uses it twice in this chapter and nowhere else in his book, but it literally means to behold with a penetrating gaze. Or you could translate the word looking, he looked right through Peter. He knew all about him. He saw everything there was to know about him. He beheld him. It's the same word that you find back here in verse 38. When Jesus turned and seeing them following, that word seeing is the same word. He looked right through them. What do you want? He knew them, if you will. Now here's what I want you to, to pick up on. Jesus acknowledges Peter by giving him the name Simon. That was his family name. He called him that. It's the Hebrew meaning to hear. Because being God, he knows everything. But then he assigns Peter another name. He calls him Cephas. Now, Cephas is an Aramaic word that means a movable stone or a pebble, something you can hold in your hand, a little rock, if you will. So he had a name, Simon. Jesus gives him a new name, Rocky. That's <laughs> his name, Rocky. A chip off the old rock, if you will. But if you read the gospel before, you realize that early on Peter was anything but stable. This guy should have been named Sandy because he sunk and got stuck every time he moved. He had no stability. He had no depth. He, he went up to the Mount of Transfiguration where the Lord was being transfigured and actually fell asleep. When he woke up in the middle of the miracle, he saw Elijah and Moses and Jesus, and he just started shooting his mouth off. We need three condos. We've got to stay here forever. We'll build one for you and one for you and one for you. And off he went. And the Father from heaven literally said, Shut up, Peter. All right, he didn't say that, but he did say this. This is my beloved son, and I'm well pleased. Hear him. And he interrupts Peter. He cuts him off. Shh, Peter, shh. Because Peter is like most of us. He thinks later, talks now, does now. That's why we like him so much. He hears from God one minute. You're the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God, and hears from the pit of hell the next. It's Peter. 
Talk now, think later. He was loyal, he was sincere, but let's face it, he was a loose cannon. He promised faithfulness when Jesus said, Tonight, all of you will betray me. And Peter went, Excuse me, point of order. Mm -mm, not all of us, not me. Turned out to be wrong. He took a sword out to fight an army as a fisherman. Not good in any sense of the word. He needed Jesus to bail him out. He had zeal without knowledge. And, and even after he got saved, he had a hard time letting go of Peter. Acts 10, he gets a vision from heaven with a bunch of unclean animals on a sheet, and the Lord says, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And Peter says, not so. And he throws in his religious word, Lord. I'm not going to do what you want, Lord. But he didn't stay that way. Slowly but surely, as a disciple of Jesus, he was transformed by the word of God and by the work of the Holy Spirit. And he would be sent as the apostles to the Jews. He would write two of the New Testament epistles. He would be the source behind the Gospel of Mark. He would preach on Pentecost, and 3,000 people would get saved in a day. And when he was done living, he would honor the Lord by being asked to be crucified upside down, because he didn't want to die the way his Lord did it. He didn't deny the Lord. He became a rock. <laughs> What's Jesus saying here to Peter? He had just met him. It was his, the third guy that was now there to be a disciple. Jesus said this, Simon, I know who you are, but I also know what you're going to be. That's what disciples, God sees you for who you are, but he also sees what you can become. And that's the role of a disciple, becoming all that God wants to do in your life. Disciples grow, we move forward, we're transformed day in and day out. What makes you different from last week and last month and last year? Is there less worldliness and less carnality and more spiritual hunger? Are you involved in ministry more or less? Do you bear more fruit or less? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Affiliate, evaluate, associate, capitulate, <laughs> evangelate. I just got to keep it in order. And transformate. That's who the disciples of Jesus are. And you can know the Lord and not be his disciple, certainly. Plenty of folks like that. But you don't want to be one of those folks because days just go into weeks and months and years. You know, you can't make those up. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. Father, this morning as we sit together, we thank you for your word. And we certainly want to be, Lord, I, I suspect all of us, your disciples. But somehow we can certainly fool ourselves into thinking we're doing just fine, when in reality, none of the things we looked at this morning speak about us. No one in the world could tell that we're, I'm affiliated with you. And if I was asked why I serve the Lord, I couldn't give a good answer. And I don't make time to associate with the Lord. I don't spend time with him. I don't make myself at home with him. And so I don't tell others. And my life is stagnant. I don't change. I go from week to week and month to month in the same pew, at the same service, at the same time, sit with the same four people and walk out in the same manner and pat myself on the back. And yet you've called us to be your disciples. And if this morning you're not a disciple, you can be, just come. Just come to Jesus. Tell him, I want to serve you. And when the Lord says to you this morning, what do you want? May he say to you, come and see, and may you go and see. Maybe it's time for a change. You've, you've been doing it your way long enough. Now come and be his disciple. He won't fail you. He won't let you down. He'll teach you everything you need to know. He's all sufficient. He's all able. He's all loving. He's all God. And he will do that wonderful work in your life. The pastors, or some of them will be up front after the service. You come. And may today be the day you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Shall we stand?